Hello and welcome to the 5-2 Diet Podcast. We're here to help you lose weight and feel great with intermittent fasting. I'm Kate Harrison from the 5-2 dietbook.com. I lost 31 pounds, that's 14 kilograms on this way of life. And I've written four books about it. I run one of the biggest 5-2 groups on the web and I still fast every single week. Fasting is easy, flexible and free. This podcast will help you 5-2. Hello and welcome to Podcast 17, which I'm recording on the very last day of 2015. Yes, it's almost time for the new year. I'm pretty excited about 2016. I always find the time after Christmas that bit dull and I will be raring to go once it's January. Even if I didn't have a calendar handy, well, I'd definitely be able to tell the time of year because the visits to our 5-2 website and the Facebook 5-2 group begin to soar after Christmas. And I know they'll be hitting their peak in January. We've already passed the 45,000 member mark. So that's a lot of people talking about intermittent fasting. It doesn't matter whether you're new to 5-2 and the fasting idea, or if you want a motivational boost, otherwise known as a kick up the backside, that's what I'm going to be delivering today. I'm going to be chatting about three things. Number one, why I think detoxes and single food fasts are not the miracles they're cracked up to be. I'm going to go through the top three strategies to make this year the one you lose weight and maintain the loss. And finally, I'll be talking a bit about how I personally prepare for New Year by following five steps to help me dream of what I really want to achieve in the year ahead. That's not just weight loss or health, but also the other rewarding things in life, travel, hobbies, friendships, work. I'll be talking through how I do that process and explaining how you can try it too. Just a very quick note, if you are brand new to 5-2, then you're best off starting at the beginning of the podcast with number one, as they'll talk you through the whole approach with lots of great interviews from people who've done it and achieved amazing things. Those podcasts are all available on iTunes or via the 5-2 dietbook.com forward slash podcast site. But if you're here for a bit more of a pep talk or some fresh ideas, then keep listening. You're in the right place. First up today, I've got some bad news. Diet miracles do not exist, I'm afraid. I'm sorry. I know we're all looking for them, but my heart sinks whenever I see someone posting about one in our big Facebook group, because I know it'll raise hopes only for them to be dashed again. Look, we all love the idea of one of those miracles, a food, a supplement, maybe a special milkshake that will burn fat or undo all the damage that has been caused by days, months or even years of decisions that perhaps weren't quite right for your body. Just lately, there was one or two of those in the 5 Two Facebook group and actually in the history of that group, there have been many of them. We've had Apple detoxes, that was the recent one. We've had similar discussions about concoctions of maple syrup and cayenne pepper. Or there's that old favourite that's been knocking around for many, many years and boy does it smell as though it has. It's the cabbage soup diet. My heart really does sink because I can completely understand why people want to believe in a kickstart that will achieve these amazing things. Let me explain why I think these diets are mostly doomed to failure. They may well work in the short term, and that's because most of these diets choose food groups which are naturally low in calories. So if you look at something like apples, you look at cabbage soup, which in the simplest form is just shredded cabbage, a bit of water, some salt and pepper, some onions. There are very few calories in those foods. And what tends to happen is you will stick to that for a certain amount of time. And you may even feel a kind of a freedom because you've almost got your blinkers on while you're following this diet very strictly. Those first days, you feel very motivated. You're not even looking at the wide array of other foods that are out there. So you start to lose weight because there are very few calories in these these particular food items. And there's also plenty of fibre often if they're fruit or vegetable based. So things are moving on the digestion front. Win win. Except boredom kicks in. And this is the problem. 
As soon as the boredom kicks in and you're tempted by something else, then not only do you feel like it's been another mistake, you've undone all your good work, you're quite likely to rebound because suddenly all those temptations are back again. However much we love, whatever the ingredient is, we crave variety in our food as human beings and your body is going to be quite powerful in making those cravings almost irresistible. It's a good reason for that because we can't survive in the very long term on one single food group. Our bodies are designed to need nutrients from all the main food groups and also from getting a variety of produce, especially all those different colours of produce. They're different colours because they contain different nutrients. The particular danger then is we have been following this for two or three days perhaps and when we fall off the bandwagon we may fall off it in spectacular fashion. We feel very tempted by all these things, perhaps we feel guilty because yet again we've failed to be able to make this work and we stuff our faces with all the food that we would normally have eaten on those two or three days. The other thing is we might actually stop doing it as a conscious decision, but then we will almost reward ourselves for our good behaviour by eating too many foods and cancelling out those calorie deficits that we've created, the lack of calories that we've caused by eating, say, cabbage soup or apples on those fast days. The other issue that I have with a lot of these is that they call themselves a detox. Now, I'm afraid that I feel anything calling itself a detox is based on pretty dubious science and often also, by coincidence or not, uh, tends to carry a high price tag or contain all sorts of strange claims that cannot be supported. Because you know what? The body does a pretty good job of detoxifying itself. If we're in good health, our kidneys and our liver are working all the time to rid our bodies of anything that isn't good for us. So anything that has detox on the label or even on the website says, oh, this is going to detox the poisons out of your system and so on. That's a big alarm bell for me, especially if it involves lots of expense, things like supplements or shakes. Okay, so now I've spread the doom and gloom about miracle detoxes. What is the alternative? Well, I suspect you probably could have guessed I would talk about intermittent fasting. But I have genuinely found it's so different. And the reason for that is because it's sustainable as a weight loss strategy, because it encourages variety and it doesn't ban anything. That means you can handle your fast days any way you like. And that's where some people are saying they eat nothing that's okay. They might only stick to apples or soups or whatever it is. If doing a fast based on a single ingredient does appeal to you, you could try it, not ruling that out, but go into it with your eyes open. It's a kickstart. It's nothing more. It's just one way of handling a fast day and it's not going to be a long-term solution. In my opinion, the best option is to focus on a variety of minimally processed foods on both fast and non-fasting days. So those are the produce aisles that you hit when you first come into the supermarket, all those lovely colours, fresh meat, fresh fish, um, frozen as well, where it's been frozen very close to the point where it was grown or raised, some dairy produce, Um, vegetable protein, those kind of things. If you try to stick to those most of the time, lots of variety, your body gets the nutrients it needs, you don't get bored, but over time you should lose weight with those two fasting days built in. My next topic today is winning strategies to reach the weight that you want. Are you ready to make this the year you reach that weight and stay there? Here are some of my top three strategies that you can use with 5-2. They actually work with any form of weight loss restriction, but 5-2 is the one I support. It will help you to look and feel at your healthy best. So many of us at this time of year have been through this new year, new you cycle too many times to remember. Starting off with good intentions and a new plan on January the 1st, only for it all to go wrong after a few days or a few weeks, we find that life or emotions or temptations scupper us. And I really know that feeling. It happened to me for years on end. So how can you make your story this year have a happy ending? Well, as someone who's been through that yo-yo cycle, I understand that hope, that despair, and I broke it through intermittent fasting. 
here are some of the approaches though that you can apply whatever diet or approach you've decided to take. Step one is plan to stay on track. Planning is the key. Most of us have a lead up to starting a new regime, whatever it is, and this planning stage can make all the difference. Work out what day you're going to start your new approach, write it in your diary or on a calendar, and in the days leading up to it, make time to do certain things. First of all, clear out all your unhelpful foods, especially the ones that you personally know will make you eat more and crave more. In my case, it's buttered toast. There you go. It's not pre-buttered, but it is the ingredients for toast. That's bread and butter. Move them out of your cupboard or perhaps just into somewhere that you won't see them so the rest of your household can still get them and replace them with better options. Place the processed foods out of reach or throw them out entirely. Lay in fresh and frozen produce and lean meats or meal replacements, meat replacements, that sort of thing, ready for your meals. The next thing I would suggest doing in this planning stage is to tell those close to you what you're doing, to explain why this matters to you and what support you need from them, whether that's keeping the biscuits out of sight or encouraging you to take a walk each evening rather than sitting in front of the telly and um, eating a TV dinner. The third part of planning is to pre-shop and pre-plan some healthy meals that will appeal to you. You could even make some soup now and freeze it or some healthy um, stews or similar food. Make sure at least that you have the right ingredients ready for your first couple of fast days if it's intermittent fasting that you're deciding to try out. Stage two of the strategies or my second strategy is around eating thoughtfully. So from day one of your new regime, think before and during and after you eat. So those three, think before you eat. Is what you're about to eat a good choice for you right now? Is it going to fill you up? Is it going to give your body the nourishment it needs and it deserves? As I said in the last section, aim for lots of different coloured vegetables to accompany lean meat, fish, eggs and veggie proteins. And take a look at those calorie counts weigh out your ingredients because sometimes there are some real surprises. You won't have to do that forever. Let's face it, you're only doing it on a fast day initially. And actually, as you get used to fast day portions, it gets easier and you won't have to weigh everything all the time. But that raised awareness of the calories that food contains is, I think, one of the keys to changing your mindset. The second thinking about food is to think as you eat. Eat slowly, savour the smells, the flavours, the textures. Sit at a table, put your cutlery down between mouthfuls and maybe eat with family and friends so you have that time to have conversation, to talk about your plans. That works both from the point of view of making it feel like a more satisfying meal but also helping relationships. The slower you eat, and I don't mean ridiculous, I'm not suggesting that you chew your food a hundred times or any of those other suggestions that really don't work, not for me anyway, but if you eat fairly slowly then the body gets time to take in the signals that you're eating, your stomach sends signals to the brain to say you're full up and you're less likely then to crave snacks later on. The third part of this is think after you eat. What aspect of this meal did you enjoy? Can you adapt the recipe for future days? Can you freeze leftovers? Make sure you jot down ideas and particularly your favourite meals that you have on the fast day so you've got a record that you can refer to in future and you'll never be stuck for something to eat. The third really important strategy I think as part of any change in diet is to learn from your lapses. We all have them. People who keep the weight off, though, they learn from them and they learn about themselves so they can avoid, mostly, those kind of lapses happening again. Think about things like, why did you eat something that actually wasn't helpful for your body or for your diet? It might have been something like circumstance, a birthday cake offered around at work. It's really hard to resist. Maybe it was something more emotional, though. You had a bad day, you were hungry... You just felt your resistance lowered and there was something in the fridge that um, you couldn't not eat. Once you had a think about what the causes might be, think about how you can stop it happening again. Some of the strategies might be 
If people are sharing the cake, take a slice but put it in your drawer for a non-fast day at work. Or maybe decide to take a walk around the block or make the cheese for everyone so that they finish the cakes by the time you come back to your desk. Another strategy, especially if you're an emotional eater, is to write down your feelings before you eat. So you can actually then get through to what is really going on that is often not hunger. Another way of doing this would be to find a friend who you can phone as an emergency, say, I've got a craving, can I talk to you about it? Can I talk to you about what might be the emotions behind this? Talk to them, write it down rather than automatically eating when you're low and vulnerable. It may not work every time, but it can be a useful thing just to stave off some of the worst of those cravings. The final practical idea is to keep a list of quick, healthy recipes handy to help you when you're hungry, but inspiration is lacking. I find something like um, a nice omelette or some steamed veg with some nice sauce on top is is perfect for me. Low effort, low energy when I'm feeling really tired um, and those hunger pangs are threatening to undo me. If you've got a list on the fridge or in the in the kitchen somewhere that you can list, you go, oh yes, I'll have that instead. The final thing about learning from your lapses is, do you know what, don't sweat it too much. Staying a healthy weight is a lifetime story and no single lapse is going to undo a mostly good balanced diet. It will only knock you off course if you let it. Instead of thinking, this is all or nothing, I've really messed up this time, just start again the next day or the next meal with a really good, nourishing dish the next time you eat. I think with these strategies, the key is to keep the long view in mind. Train yourself over time to take better decisions most of the time. Create a home environment that encourages good choices and great health and decide to learn from your mistakes instead of always beating yourself up. We are only human. By working on the right strategies now and over the next few months, this time next year, eating well will come much more naturally. Now it's time for the third and final topic in today's podcast. And as we are approaching New Year, I want to talk about how you can make this coming year the best it can be. I am a huge fan of taking a little bit of time out at the end of each year to look at the high and low points of the previous year and to use those and to dream a little bit about how you can make the coming year fantastic. It's not about resolutions that you might break in week one, but it is about allowing yourself to dream and to fantasise a bit about what will make you and those close to you that bit happier. So as I say, this has been part of my routine for more than 10 years now. And for the last few years, I've had a short guide to what I do up on the 5.2 website. But this year, I decided to give it an overhaul and add lots of new inspiring material. And because it's not just about weight loss or fitness, it can apply to anything in your life. I've put it up on my personal website. It's an 18 page free ebook download. And I think that you can use it for anything. As examples over the years, I've used it to help me write books, change career, lose weight, definitely, and even move to a new country. You can download it for free via my website. So you can either pause now and go off and download it or go a bit later after you've listened to it and decided if it's for you or not. But the link you need is my website. So that's kate-harrison.com forward slash dreams 2016. So that's kate-harrison.com forward slash the word dreams and then the number 2016 dreams 2016. You go to that uh, section and follow the instructions. And let me now explain a bit about what I do each year. And I find these steps really fun and You might think, oh, when am I going to have time to do this? Well, you don't have to fit it in at a particular time of year. You could do it in February if you like. The important thing is just to look back. And I think a lot of that, a lot of us find that easiest at the end of the year because we can go January to December. So my five steps. Number one, reviewing the last 12 months. Number two is to choose your priorities for the coming year. The third step, step three, imagine how you'd like to feel in 12 months time. Step four is to make plans to get that to happen in the year ahead. And then step five is an ongoing set of plans and ideas to make those things happen. 
So step one, review the last 12 months. So I've been doing this a bit lately and it's a little bit easier for me because I've got my list of things I wanted to achieve in 2015 that I made at the last, the end of the last year in 2014. Mostly I probably achieve about four fifths of what I set out to do. This year, if I'm honest, it's been a bit less than that because 2015 has been a strange year. As I speak now, we haven't got long to go to the new year, so I might be tempting fate here, but um, there haven't been so far any big hospital dashes, no major crises, nothing like that, which is always a massive blessing. But equally, it's felt like a bit of a slog this year sometimes. I've been doing a lot of things that haven't yet borne fruit. I've had some setbacks personally and at work. A lot of the time it's felt like I'm preparing for big changes, doing the groundwork, but I haven't quite got there yet. It was really important to me to look at those objectives, but also to look at some of the things that I didn't expect to come up this year that I have actually done. So things like I've worked with um, some of the other authors locally with me here in Brighton in the UK to set up a writing school. Um, With my partner, we bought and refurbished a beach hut. I've maintained my healthy weight, which is always a massive bonus for me at the end of the year to think, you know what, I'm the same weight as I was this time last year, give or take a mince pie or two. I volunteered with a local charity. I've actually done the training, but haven't started doing the sessions yet. I've set up these 5-2 podcasts. I have decluttered my body weight in stuff. So that's bags of books and clothes and whatnot, taking it down the charity shop. I've been running outdoors um, in the summer and now it's a bit colder. I've rejoined the gym and I finished writing my first novel in three years, which has been quite a battle at times in terms of confidence. But I've got there keeping my fingers crossed. I'm also going to give myself a bit of credit, you know, for coming out the other side of some of those setbacks. I've also done some writing events. Uh, One of my objectives last year was to read for 30 minutes every day, um, including a lot more fiction, because I'd found that I was finding it harder to read novels. And I've stuck to that. And it's been very rewarding. So if I look then at the whole of the year, one of the things I like to do is almost imagine that um, I am coming up with a headline, a review of the year, and mine for my headline and summary would be something like, ready, steady, go. 2015 was about laying the foundations for a busier and hopefully better 2016. Step two is to choose your priorities and your themes for the coming year. And remember, this is all written down in the ebook, so don't feel you have to make notes. I just thought I'd talk you through my process so that you have an idea uh, of what it's like in practice. So there are lots of different themes you can choose. Some of the ones I've used in the past are things like fitness and health, family and friends, so you want to spend more time with them or really work on those relationships, your work and your business. Money is a big one for a lot of us to set in train some better financial choices or to be in a position to save for something that's really important to us. Creativity is a big one for me and it's something that a lot of people neglect and yet as human beings we're made to be creative whether that's writing stories, whether it's making music, whether it's doing something physical with our hands, knitting or woodwork, whatever it is, creativity is one we shouldn't neglect. It can give us so much pleasure. You might want to look at fun. Fun is a really good theme for the year. Perhaps it's organising your life, getting more organised, streamlined so that you spend less time scrabbling around trying to um, pay the fines because you haven't paid a parking ticket or whatever it is. Maybe travel and exploration beckons in 2016. Could be your home, trying to make your home a more comfortable and welcoming environment. Or it might be love if you're single. Um, or if you're looking to make your loving relationships um, that bit closer. The final one might be something like giving back. You might feel that you've um, been looking inward for a long time and you actually want to look outwards at your community, at people in need where you live or in the world at large. So those are some of the themes. There's a list of them in the little free ebook. My story this year, well, after reviewing my year in, in step one, I realised that there were certain things that give me most happiness and that some of them were neglected in 2015. So in 2016, my themes are going to be my creative work, my close friends and family, and finally a bit of an odd one, caring more and less. 
And I'll explain that a bit more. I've worked out that I can spend a lot of time worrying and wondering what other people think. And I know I'm not alone in that. I think that social media can encourage this sometimes because we're constantly looking for approval or looking for likes or comparing ourselves to other people's lives. Facebook and Twitter are great ways of learning about new things, keeping in touch with what your friends are up to, making new friends, sharing ideas. I love the 5-2 group, but sometimes I find myself being sucked into this very insular world, just me and the screen worrying and fretting, especially because I'm a writer and so sometimes people post negative things. And I've decided that for this year I want to devote that energy that I spend on people who don't know me and may not have my best interests at heart on the things I care about and about creating more things and also doing things that matter to the people that I do care about and that do have my best interests at heart. Step three then, imagine how you'd like to feel in 12 months time. This is probably my favourite bit to be honest because I love um, getting out my pens and paper and and doing some doodling and that's what I want you to do. Uh, You just take three sheets of paper or pages in a notebook. Use um, a pen that's a pleasure to write with, uh, maybe different colours if you like, and write down the first priority area that you've picked in the centre of a fresh sheet and set a timer on your mobile phone or the kitchen for at least five minutes. You've got ten, even better, and start jotting down ideas as they come to you about how you could your life could be better if you achieve certain things in that area. One year from today, what could you have done that would have made the difference in that particular area of your life? Do not censor yourself. This is brainstorming. It's a time to dream. And don't stop either. Keep the pen moving. Draw, doodle, sketch, if you'd rather do that than writing. Be a bit crazily ambitious. Imagine a super-powered year and a super-powered you. But also don't neglect the smaller and less glamorous objectives. For example, under health one year, I put have healthy teeth with no pain. Doesn't sound like a dream, but I'm somebody who is a bit paranoid and really hates the dentist. But I made facing up to that problem and going to the dentist a priority and boy, did I feel better afterwards. As you're writing these ideas, build on them. So if you want to be more creative, ask yourself, what does that mean? What do you want to have created by this time next year? painting a watercolour perhaps, knitting jumpers, writing a novel. The more specific you can be, the easier it's going to be to imagine. If you write be much fitter, well how are you going to judge whether you've done that by this time next year? It could be running a 10k race, it could be swimming three times a week or maybe it means being your local ballroom dancing champion. Once you've done that for one priority, do the same for the other two. You can space it out if you haven't got half an hour at a time. You may find that as you're doing it, you're actually beginning to veer away from the priority that you did pick, say from fitness to work-life balance, for example. At this stage, do you know what? That's absolutely cool. Welcome any surprises. This can be really revealing. There might be surprise things that you write down that could improve your life in unexpected ways. Once you've done this, take a break. As I said, I really enjoy doing this and imagining myself this time next year and what would have made me happy made me realise how important it is for me to enjoy my creative work. But I also wanted to raise the issue of the dark side of imagination, if you like. If you are thinking about where things might be, you might think, actually, they could be terrible. You know, something awful might happen between now and this time next year. And, And particularly, there are a lot of very tragic stories in the news. There are a lot of concerns globally and locally. The truth is we can't know what's going to happen on that level. And you might think, well, in that case, what's the point in planning? But I think that if you've got a bit of a roadmap, you can be aware then when you're going off the path, not beat yourself up about it, but to be conscious of when you need to do that and when perhaps it's time to step back towards the things that you really love to do. Step four, so the next one, and we're almost there, I promise, is to make plans for your year ahead. And this is where I've suggested you have a bit of a break to let some of those ideas, the imaginative brainstorming, ferment a bit. I do think it's a little bit like fermenting. It gets better over time. 
Return to those dream sheets and then begin to circle or highlight with a highlighter pen the ideas and objectives that you find the most appealing or the most important in terms of improving your life. You're aiming for a bit of a mixture of things that inspire you and also things that will have the most powerful positive effect. Once you've identified those important ones, write them down as a separate list. So for a whole year, I would probably aim for about three ideas or plans or objectives for each priority area of your life. So that would be a maximum of three. Now, if they're really huge objectives, I don't know, build a new house, for example, or lose a lot of weight, you might decide to focus on that as the only objective under that priority area. So whatever, you'll end up with about three to nine objectives. And again, if the numbers here are confusing you, just take a look at the free ebook. Now, if you need to begin to break down those individual, those tasks, the three to nine tasks into smaller ones. Um, What I mean by that, if you have got built a new house, well, that's huge. So you then need to start thinking about all the different stages to make this happen. Once you've thought through those, thought about what the stages might be, get yourself a calendar or a sheet that shows all 12 months of the year to come on a single page. Start by marking down the commitments that you've already got. So that might be holidays you've booked, school holidays, work deadlines, big family celebrations, caring commitments, how the months look, particularly the next three months. And think about the first of the priorities under each of the categories that you would like to tackle first. Choose just the one from each of those three priority areas and work out what you'd need to do in January, February and March to be on track to start to achieve them. Some of the aims may take longer and in that, if that's the case, then spread them out through the year. I know, for example, that if I time my getting fit objectives with when the weather starts getting a bit better and when I have a bit more energy because the days are longer, I'm more likely to succeed. Whereas if one of your objectives is to preserve your own food, well, the harvest months are going to be best for that. Let me give you my examples then. So I've looked at my year as a whole and my objectives. I won't share all my plans as some of the people who are positively affected by them could be listening along and I don't want to spoil the surprise. But some of the ideas that I've picked uh, as really firm objectives for 2016 include researching and writing another novel. That's a biggie. Uh, do much more entertaining as I love cooking and hosting people but I haven't been able to do that much recently because we've had a lot of building work. I also want to develop a lot more of the reviews and writing about the things I love on my website and I want to become more involved in the local community through the charity that I volunteered for and also the writing school I've set up with the other authors. So having done that, I then start to focus specifically on the first few months of this year. I've already got some work and personal commitments and deadlines for that time. So the goals for January are designed to fit in around quite a heavy month. But here are some of the specifics. This is the kind of thing I'm talking about for January. Number one is to develop the review side of my blog so that I have a review or best of blog post appearing each week. And I want to use that downtime I might feel fed up on social media to actually write about positive things, things that I am passionate about, businesses I love, local um, chefs, local cafes, that kind of thing. Objective two is to volunteer for two sessions with the local charity. That's very specific. And number three is to host the first dinner in our finished off house by the end of the month. Got to get those invitations out. Number four is to book a Paris trip because I want to go to Paris because um, the next book idea I've got is partly set there. And number five is to read three research books for that next idea. I know that January is not always the best month. I probably won't travel to Paris this month, but I really think that it's perfect weather for reading. You know what I mean? And that's something tangible I can do. I'll know by the end of January, have I read three research books or not? That writing another book objective is huge um, and it's a great example of one that will take all year fundamentally. So I know that I will probably plan to research in the first few months to start writing through the spring and summer when I've got lots of writing energy and then try to edit towards the autumn. Doing more on my website, though, is more of a shorter term goal because I know that it's something I really want to do and if I can establish that as a good habit over the first couple of months in this year it will become um, automatic a bit of a routine to me and one I know that I'll get feedback on and I'm sure I'll enjoy. I also know looking forward that March is going to be a busy month for me so 
once I've got the first lots of those objectives that I was talking about done, I will probably aim to start a whole new set in the April. We are almost there and we're at step five, which is make it happen. And actually, this is something that you'll be working on all the way through 2016, or if you're listening in future, whichever year you've picked. And it's about keeping your dreams in view and being accountable. So keeping your dreams in sight, I literally mean in physical sight, put them somewhere where you can see them. You could um, put them, make a mood board of images, put them on your desktop, on your computer, print them out really small and then laminate your goals so that you've got them in your wallet. Or what I do is I just keep my objectives at the bottom of the to-do list on my computer. So when I've got things like collect dry cleaning or MOT the car or whatever, I can still see the things that really matter and that avoids me getting too distracted by the minutiae of everyday life. The next thing, stay accountable. I really think it's important to review your goals regularly, even a quick glance, because then you're more likely to keep to them. Lots of ways you could do this. You could share them with a close friend or family member. Also, we're going to be posting them in the Five to Your Life Facebook group, which is free, and there'll be a link to that on the podcast show notes. Uh, We'll be sharing how we're all getting on and keeping you accountable. If that's a bit too public for you, you can make a weekly appointment with yourself to review how you've done that week and what you can do in the coming days towards your goal. Some days I find are a really good time. Take stock. Needn't take very long. The other thing to do is to put in your diary for every three months to do a bit more of an in-depth review. Check how you're getting along. Are you making the progress you need to make to be on track or has something taken you off track? And this takes me to the third point. Be flexible. Life will get in the way. Other opportunities may come up. You may face some difficulties along the way, but that is part of life and part of the fun. Reviewing your goals every two to three months may help you realise that actually you picked ones which weren't quite right and that you would be better off tweaking those slightly or changing them. That's okay once or twice. I certainly wouldn't recommend chopping and changing every time something gets difficult though, because sometimes the more difficult goals are the ones that will bring the greatest rewards. But either way, it's cool. It's your decision. I want to say a word about difficult times. And if things do conspire against you, events, whatever it is, be as kind to yourself as you would be to a good friend in exactly the same position. Don't self-criticise. But once immediate difficulties have passed, consider if you could maybe set a smaller version of those same goals to help you feel good about yourself. Even doing something small for yourself can feel selfish if you're facing lots of issues. But it's not selfish. The happier you are, the more able you are to help and support those around you. It was John Lennon, I think, who said, life is what happens when you're making other plans. And he had a great point. We'll never know what's around the corner. But that's all the more reason to think about what makes you happy and the people around you happy. Whatever your year has in store, I do wish you lots of brilliant moments to enjoy and I hope to celebrate the achievements as well. Remember, you can download lots of information and the full free ebook about this via my website, kate-harrison.com forward slash dreams 2016. Well, that's the end of today's podcast. I hope you've enjoyed it. For motivation and advice on 5.2, you cannot get any better than our fantastic Facebook group, which is free to join and also private, so your messages won't show up on your timeline. You can find it at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash the 52 diet. You can also tweet me at the 52 diet. That's the five two diet, the numbers in the middle, or tweet me on my personal account at Kate Writes Books, because that's what I do. If you are in the mood for a delicious new recipe, by the way, I've just posted up a recipe from my second cookbook, The 5-2 Good Food Kitchen, and that recipe is for lemongrass and ginger pork with noodles, a really warming dish for wintry evenings. But it also works well with tofu if, like me, you're a vegetarian. It's a perfect fast day meal. And of course, you can find much more in the way of recipes and inspiration in my books. The Ultimate 5-2 Recipe Book and 5-2 Good Food Kitchen are all about the food. The 5-2 Diet Book is about my journey and the science behind 5-2. And 5-2 Your Life is along the lines of that goal setting stuff that I was talking about before. 
They're all available. You can look and download samples via my website. Thank you so much for listening. I had a lot to get through today, but um, I'm feeling inspired about 2016. I hope you are too. I wish you a very happy and a very healthy new year. For many more free tips, case studies, recipes, and lots of information, visit the 5-2dietbook.com. Follow me on Twitter at the52diet or download free samples of the books online at Amazon. Thanks for listening.